Let me just share my screen and get started. So um, as Alon said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the arc of our work about how hippocampus and prefrontal cortex interact to acquire knowledge and help us use that knowledge in service of memory-based decision making. So across the talk today, I'll tell you about a little bit about um, some of our older work over the past you know, five to 10 years, but also um, several of our newer kind of studies um, that are progressing this line of research further. And so when I think about um, memory and how we uh, both acquire knowledge and use memory, I really think about it in this constructive sense that when we're actually experiencing a new event, we're not learning about that in isolation. Rather, when we're learning about new experiences, we often um, call to mind either um, explicitly or automatically our past experiences. And in doing so, we might influence how we, um, uh, got, how learning is done in the present. And so, sorry, um, by recalling past events during new experiences, that allows us to extract knowledge beyond um, our direct observation. So you can extract knowledge about the commonalities um, among your different experiences or how they're distinct from one another. And that um, ability to extract that knowledge is often thought to underlie what people call cognitive maps or memory spaces or knowledge structures um, that code these unobserved relationships among multiple episodes. And so this is a very powerful aspect of human memory um, because it's highly flexible. Um, it allows us to support both prediction and make inferences in new contexts and across multiple task domains. And if we didn't have this capacity um, as humans, we'd be a pretty rigid learning system, right? Our experiences that we have, um, we would encode them and they would be limited. They would be very um, non-generalizable if we didn't make these connections and extract and for this kind of knowledge. So, to give you kind of a, a toy example that relates to some of the paradigms that I'll talk to you about today, I often use this particular one in my talk. So I'm gonna ask you to kind of imagine a, a, a scenario where you're leaving your um, uh, house or your flat to come to um, campus, for instance, and you happen to see this gentleman leave um, a, you know, the place next door to you that was perhaps for let. Um, and so you notice him leave the house uh, to walk his dog and you might think, oh, that gentleman must be my new neighbor. And then at a later time, you might see um, that same dog um, on your walk through the park a couple weeks later, but this time the dog is being walked by a woman. And so in this case, right, there's these two different experiences share content. So as you're walking through the park, you would notice the same dog. And so the fact that these, these two events share different types of memory content allows you to um, reactivate those prior learning experiences, again, either automatically or explicitly. I and mean, so you might think about the first time that you saw that dog um, being walked by the gentleman um, uh, leaving the house next door to you, for instance. And so in doing so, reactivating the memories might cause you to um, store the new event as an overlapping memory trace with your pre-existing knowledge. So you might link these two events that were separated in time together. And that's a very adaptive thing to do because it allows you to represent um, kind of commonalities or common associations in this case that allows you to reason about the relationships between unobserved properties of the world. So in this case, you might, you not only code the direct um, associations that you observe the man and the dog and the woman and the dog, but you might also code an indirect relationship like that, uh, that the man and the woman share a relationship, or in fact, that the woman shares a relationship to the house next door to you and, and thus she may also be your new neighbor. An alternative coding strategy is to actually um, treat these two events as separate, right? And so you alternatively really may separate the, or differentiate these codes um, in neural terms so that they end up with non-overlapping um, ensembles of, of neurons that represent those experiences. And so these separate codes emphasize the differences between these events, which has a different kind of adaptive function, right? And so, you know, a code like this is stereotypically and computationally thought to support the ability to resolve um, the details between highly overlapping experiences. So it might allow you to distinguish when you experience seeing um, the woman um, from when you saw the man. So if I asked you where you saw the woman, you'd be able to accurately tell me you first um, noticed her walking through the park with this dog, rather than having kind of a false experience of um, associating her the first time you saw her with the neighborhood next door, 
So both of these uh, coding strategies are very adaptive. Um, and I actually think the, the both serve an important role in how we form cognitive maps of experience. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what, we're, what I'm calling cognitive map formation um, in a few domains of experience. So as I mentioned in that kind of toy real world example, one of the things these, these kind of connections or in that, that example, rudimentary cognitive map allows you to do is reason about these unobserved relationships in the environment. It's, you know, this term cognitive map, again, initially came out of the, the world of the work of um, Tolman, who uh, studied this in the spatial navigation um, world. So it's also thought to underlie our ability to navigate our environments. Um, it allows us to think and extract conceptual knowledge, make context decision, dependent decisions, and imagine and create novel solutions to problems. And so all of these um, particular examples of kind of higher order cognitive functions um, that might be served by these kind of basic knowledge extraction processes. Um, I study in my lab, but I'm only gonna have time to talk to you, give you a few examples from the first four domains. And so the, in the context of today's talk, I'll first talk about some of our initial and actually some more recent follow-up work looking about how neural, um, uh, how hippocampus and prefrontal cortex learn to represent overlapping events. Um, I'll move on to talk about a, a study that looks at the formation of hierarchical cognitive maps. So how it, you can code um, kind of similarities and differences together at different levels of knowledge abstraction. Um, we'll then talk, move to a study that talks about generalization experience across um, task domains. So how a cognitive map formed in one context can influence how you process and experience information in a new context. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of our work in the domain of concept learning um, to talk about how concept maps might actually, um, one of the roles that prefrontal cortex might serve is through kind of attention guided dimensionality reduction to help pick out those properties of the environment that are worth representing and are mostly adaptive to learn. So throughout all the studies, I'm gonna focus particularly on, the, as my title allied, the interactions between hippocampus and in particular medial prefrontal cortex. And this is just a schematic that we've talked about in a, a number of reviews, us and others, to think about how these two structures interact as a functional loop. And so, of course, hippocampus is well known to bind together the associative features in the environment. Um, it's well known computationally to differentiate features um, that lead to different outcomes. And so it's thought to form these kind of potentially hierarchical associative representations, which then through direct productions of the medial prefrontal cortex, um, might inform, you know, might send information about those associations to medial prefrontal cortex, which again might do a higher order process by which it pulls out, for instance, latent causes. So the factors that underlie um, the same, leading to the same outcomes from the environment. Um, the last three I'll talk about, we'll talk about how uh, it might reduce dimensionality in a goal dependent manner to help, um, again, tune the representations in, in, in hippocampus. So again, through this top-down input, medial prefrontal cortex may bias encodings, the initial learning towards these goal-relevant features. Um, during uh, generalization or decision-making, it might bias selection of most, the most behaviorally relevant memories or associations um, to evaluate which potential action is the right one to take in a context. So it's kind of the general overarching framework, the way I think about how these two structures are interacting in um, conceptual terms. And so, for the rest of the talk, I'll you know, tease apart some studies that are testing some of these hypotheses um, set out in this kind of framework. So the first study I'll talk about was one of, uh, one of our initial ones looking at these particular questions done by Meg Schlichting, a former graduate student in my lab, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. So this will, it's set out to address this first question, looking at how um, different structures in the brain represent commonalities and differences between overlapping events through learning. And so what Meg did is she had people learn a task very similar to the man, woman, dog example that I provided at the outset. In this, in this particular task, people learn overlapping associations between three-dimensional novel objects. So these are stimuli we created in the lab um, because we didn't want our participants to have pre-experimental familiarity with them. And so how this task is structured is that you might see this um, green object first paired with this black object. And then you, 
um, after some intervening trials, you might see the black object again, but this time paired with a new object, this blue and purple object. And so they see many of these overlapping pairs um, in this study and either tested both on their memory for these direct relationships, but also we give them a surprise influence test where they have to reason about um, the indirectly related objects that share a common associate. So here, this blue and purple one might be given as a cue and they have to ask which to which object does it share a relationship? And this one, um, the answer would be the green one, of course, because they are both associated to the black object in this example. And so, you know, you might imagine um, that what happens when you experience the second overlapping association is much like what I described for the man, woman, dog example. So upon seeing this overlapping memory contact, this black object that you've seen before, you might reactivate your previous experience. And the, the idea is that that reactivation might influence how you encode this separate, separate object. It might promote either differentiation where you actually produce orthogonal rep representations of these two um, overlapping pairs to allow you to resolve their differences, or you could potentially um, uh, treat them as similar. So integrate them together in your memory to allow you to potentially reason more accurately and faster. And so we'll, we'll address that particular aspect in a couple studies from now. But first we really just wanted to look at how um, the tuning of different hippocampal and prefrontal regions um, represented these kind of overlapping associations. And so in addition to this study phase, which I described to you, we actually scanned people prior to learning the associations themselves. So they saw the individual objects in isolation one at a time. Um, they studied the overlapping pairs. And then after learning, we then showed all the individual objects again in this post-study exposure phase. And so the idea is here, we could look and compare the neural representations elicited by individual objects from pre to post study to see how they were influenced by this um, you know, overlapping association task, what we call the associative inference task. And so what we did is we actually measured here, this is like a toy pattern. We took a toy um, pattern of activation in a given um, set of voxels within a brain region and looked um, how the pattern shifted from pre and post study. So we looked at that comparing um, for the objects that shared an indirect relationship. So that's the within triad comparison here, the blue and the purple one. And then we, as baseline, we looked at also all the across triad relationships for which they did not share associations. And what you can imagine we looked for is um, those regions where you saw a decrease in similarity um, across learning. So after learning, the representations evoked by the two indirectly related associates actually became more dissimilar, right? So they decreased in their similarity across learning, reflecting this differentiation. Alternatively, look, we looked also for regions where you saw the opposite pattern, where the neural patterns elicited by these um, indirectly related objects became more similar as a function of learning, so reflecting potentially integration in this case. And so when we looked, um, when we did this analysis, looking for these two potential kind of representational strategies, what we found is different parts of the hippocampus and medial prefrontal cortex um, showing both differentiation and integration. So I'll focus on the differentiation, which are represented in blue first. So there you see the posterior hippocampus and the anterior medial prefrontal cortex were more likely to differentiate these indirectly related associations after learning um, as a function of learning their overlapping associations. Whereas um, posterior medial prefrontal cortex here in green and anterior hippocampus again here in green were more likely to um, show uh, increased similarity between these two indirectly related so associates to a function of learning. So this suggests there's these complementary circuits that um, learn these have different biases in which the way they represent overlapping um, information with the anterior hippocampus and medial prefrontal cortex potentially more focused or biased to um, uh, code commonalities across events. And so these two structures have also been implicated in um, schema formation or the formation of contextual or situational models. And many people think that this kind of coding relate, relates to the formation of abstract conceptual knowledge kind of extracting general principles about the environment that are allowed for generalization. In contrast, 
the posterior hippocampus and this more anterior part of prefrontal cortex in this study here in blue, um, they form, have a different coding bias that the memories are made more distinct from one another when they're highly overlapping. And that is maybe important for maintaining the details of specific events, um, which is an important principle that allows for resolution of interference between highly overlapping memories. And so in this study, we see that um, the formation of these complementary codes within different parts of the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus that um, might be um, important for different aspects of memory function. And so <clears throat> in a follow recent follow-up study to this initial work, we actually really wanted to ask the question about how these kind of representational changes that we see in these um, hippocampal and uh, in particular regions were dependent on reactivation during learning. So in the, that study, um, what we're trying to do now is not only look at how the representations of the two indirectly um, associates uh, change, but how thinking about, for instance, the man when learning about the woman um, influences whether you integrate or differentiate those two um, items in memory. And this is work done by a former graduate student, Robert Moulter in my lab. And so again, it's a very similar um, kind of conceptual layout to the study that we did. Um, we use different kinds of materials in this, in this particular variant of the study. But again, it's the same construction where you see two overlapping associations during the study phase. Here, um, the, in one of the first associations, you either saw a face or a scene paired with this two-dimensional silhouette. And that in a later point in time, that silhouette would be repeated um, and this time um, would be seen with a three-dimensional a three object. And so again, we use this pre and post study exposure um, uh, design where we showed all of the individual faces, scenes and three-dimensional objects both before and after learning. And so what's different from the first study that I described to you is that we are also um, able to quantify reactivation. So we actually scan people while they were studying these overlapping associates as well. And so you could quantify how much they think about, for instance, a related scene in this example, when learning about the second associate and what consequence that had for how you represent the relationship between this scene and the three-dimensional object. And so here, what I'm just showing is the regions where we were able to decode evidence of reactivation during the new learning. And so we did that using a, a neural classifier approach based on localizer data. And so here, um, regions in the parietal cortex, the occipital cortex, um, both the medial and lateral parietal cortex, showed evidence for reactivating the faces and scenes during the second overlapping associate. And so we used activation in this network to quantify the degree, right, the strength of reactivation during the second overlapping associate. And we wanted to look about how that reactivation influenced whether you saw um, differentiation or integration. So here, we split trials into whether they showed strong evidence for reactivation or weak evidence for reactivation. So the dark bars are strong, the light bars are the weaker reactivation. And we wanted to look for those two groups of trials. What was the neural similarity change, right? So here is one hypothesized direction. So with greater reactivation, you see more repulsion of the overlapping um, or the indirectly related items. So here on the strong reactivation trials, we might expect that causes these two items, the indirectly related object and scene in this example, to be more coded more differently from one another than after learning than they were before. Converse, and so in those regions, in this particular study, we were really focused on the hippocampus and hippocampal subfields in particular. And so in this study, what we showed is the dent, a combined region of dentate gyrus and CA23 were more likely to differentiate information um, uh, during when it was the overlapping content was strongly reactivated during the second encoding experience. In contrast, we, you could expect the converse pattern, right? So here with strong reactivation, that might actually lead to a different kind of coding strategy leading to integration where the two overlapping associates, associates are coded more similar to one another after learning. And there we actually saw evidence for CA1 showing that particular pattern of response. So with CA1 showing the increased likelihood to code two indirectly related events as more similar to one another after learning. 
And so here you show for the very same trials, two different biases to how this kind of information is coded in memory, which again, may have a different consequences for uh, memory-based decision-making. And this is very similar to um, uh, an updated version of the complementary learning systems model um, that was adapted by Anna Shapiro, um, who modeled actually this associative inference task is one of the tasks she did in this kind of simulations paper. And in that paper, she found that um, uh, proposed or uh, that these neural networks um, that represented these, the circuit of the hippocampus, CA2 th or CA3 and dentate were more likely to kind of differentiate overlapping experiences where CA1 was more likely to form information about regularities or commonalities in the world. And so here we provide some empirical evidence for this particular computational prediction that comes out of this model. Okay, so, so far, I've showed you that you can form these kind of complementary codes for these integrated and separated record or differentiated representations in memory, both um, in different parts of the hippocampus and in medial prefrontal cortex. But really, a, a lot of this um, recent work has suggested that what's actually maybe being formed is hierarchical cognitive maps where both um, similarities and differences are simultaneously represented within the same networks. Um, and that allows you to form a richer structure um, to allow for more flexible decision-making. And so I'll talk about some of our more recent ways we think about this um, from a postdoc in my lab, Neil Morton, um, and some of his recently published work on this particular topic. So just again, to give you a different real-world example to, to think about um, kind of these hierarchical representations, I'll ask you to imagine that you're traveling to Nashville. So um, Neil got his PhD with Sean Cullen and, at Vanderbilt. So that's why we're gonna use Nashville as one of our examples here. And so you can imagine if, you know, after the pandemic, when we're all hopefully back to normal, you can fly into the airport in Nashville and take a ride share um, to Vanderbilt campus here. Um, and that you give a talk and have, you know, meetings with some colleagues during the day. And that later that night, um, you, your host, for instance, takes you downtown to have dinner and drinks in downtown Nashville. And so these are two direct trajectories in space that you directly um, experience. And so that you can imagine making an inference, for instance, about how to get from your hotel, for instance, downtown to the airport the next day. So that's how you form a cognitive map, you know, a, an example of how you form a toy cognitive map in, uh, the relationships between locations within a city. When you think about that, those same kind of relational geometries that represent national might actually be useful in other particular contexts. So here we'll actually jump away with to Austin, where I'm from. And so you can take these relational structures about cities and generalize them. Um, so when you're coming to Austin, you might realize that the airport tends to be far away from downtowns and universities, and university and downtowns tend to be very close to one another. And so you might pull out a geometric structure that actually generalizes across these two particular um, cities that allow you to um, navigate um, and make some best guesses about where things are when traveling to a new city, for instance. And so Neil's work is going to actually look at this kind of more, this higher order um, kind of generalization ability in the very same tasks that I first described to you. So we're going to go back um, to actually Meg's task, variant of the task with these overlapping object associations. And so again, what people see in these tasks are these three overlapping objects. They learn them as individual pairs. Pairs, they might see this A and this B pair. So here A is the or orange object, the B is the black object. They'll see the black object again, so B. And then they'll see it this time with a new object here is C is the blue and purple one. And so they see again, many of these across the experiment. And so there are many different kind of associations you can extract from these very simple tasks. You can have a first order association, which is just an observed relationship that you're um, cued to learn in this task. So you learn or cued to learn that the orange one goes with the black one. So that would be very similar to traversing from the Nashville airport to Vanderbilt, right? A direct pathway that you experience. You can also make the second order inference, which is what we've been talking about um, through the first part of this talk, is that you might be able to infer the direct re indirect relationship between these two objects that Sarah and associate. So that would be, again, very similar to inferring the pathway between downtown Nashville and the airport. Um, but also, you know, the kind of the new kind of part of Neil's work is to look at this kind of third order relationship. The idea that you see many of these what we call triads across the experiment. 
and that there might be kind of a generalized structure that reflects the similarities between um, these different associative um, stru structures. So you have these direct and indirect relationships and that, that would be very similar to generalizing structures across um, Nashville and Austin to allow you to navigate those cities. And so this is what Neil is really interested in. Can people form these higher order structures independent of um, kind of reinforcement? So they're not reinforced to learn any of this information nor this information in this task. We were very interested in how this might form just as a function of knowledge extraction itself. And so to kind of think about this in, in neural terms, what this might imagine is that you have these two triads, a green one and a, um, the blue one. So here, this little depictions of what the items within those triads. And so you might imagine that here is what I, you know, we've been talking a lot about. You form these direct relations between A and B and B and C, and you make an inference between A and C items here. And so you could just kind of form one of those for each of the triads. But if you were extracting a generalizable structure across the triads, what you might expect is those kind of geometries might be aligned in neural terms, and that you may have these consistent um, geometric relationships across the triads that allow for more efficient knowledge organization. And this is, we were inspired by work um, from Stefano Fusi's lab um, in non-human primates um, to think about these kind of neural geometries that it might allow for a higher order extraction of knowledge even through this kind of simple geometric relationships. And so how Neil actually went about quantifying that is to think about um, the vector spaces that might reflect these indirectly related objects so that you might have a vector direct that not only direct represents the distance, but the direction um, in neural terms between an individual A and C item from a triad. And you could use that vector direction to make predictions about the other relationships between indirectly related objects from other triads. So here you just take that vector and add it um, to the representation for an A item to make a prediction about where its corresponding C item should be. And for somebody who actually encodes consistent geometric relationships, there should be a lot of generalizability in the sense that this prediction should highly um, be accurate at predicting their actual representation for these indirectly related associations. And so that's exactly what um, Neil did to quantify this particular um, relationship. So he took neural patterns elicited after kind of learning from um, the indirectly related objects from a given triad. So here you just subtract the representations of these two indirectly related objects. And that way you get a vector and, and distance and direction that represents the relationship in neural space um, between these two objects. Then you take that vector and you add it right to, the, to an item representation from another triad. So here's an A item for another triad. You add the distance, the vector um, between A and C from this original triad, and you get a predicted right location in neural space. And you can compare that to the observed one in neural space. And so when he did that, what he found is a series of, here I'm just plotting um, prefrontal and, and hippocampal, but also we saw parietal regions that showed this extraction of these representational geometries that showed consistent um, uh, representations across these um, triads. So they're not only inferring um, second order properties, but they're inferring for third order properties through formation of these structures. And so again, I'll just emphasize that these are formed in the absence of external feedback in this particular task. So again, people were only told they had to learn the direct relationships and that's the only information that they were um, reinforced for. Um, they had no kind of reinforcement for learning the other um, aspects of this task. So these are kind of automatically um, extracted um, in some participants and that's what we'll get to next is that we were really curious is does the, do these kind of organizations confer a behavioral advantage? What do they mean for people's ability to um, do the task we asked them to in this particular case? So here we quantified people's individual differences in the representation and geometry. And here I'm just showing you two um, individual subject patterns from the anterior hippocampus. So this is an individual with very high organization where the vector directions between the A and C items across the triads is very similar. Here's an individual with somebody who has low organization where the vector directions between the individual triad relationships are very different um, across the triads. And so we use this as an individual difference measure in this task. And then specifically, we wanted to relate it to um, the behavior we had in this particular case, which is one about the second order inference of so being able to infer the indirect relationship between these two particular items. 
And what we found is that those people who showed in hippocampus very high organization, so that they showed this consistent vector direction between the triads, were actually much faster here in plotting response time in the inference task. Um, so here they were much faster to answer these inferences as a function of having formed um, kind of even a third order relationship um, in this case. And that was also true in other regions, including POC and parietal cortex. So some kind of interim conclusions from this body of work, we see the hippocampus and PFC extract general properties across experiences, and these allow the formation of predictive maps that allow for inference about these unobserved relationships in the environment. And in particular, anterior hippocampus and CA1 may play a particularly important role for representing generalities across experiences and pulling out these common or inferred properties. So, now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, for the second kind of major part of the talk and to talk about a different domain of experience. And that's one um, that's navigation related. And so here I'm gonna ask, ask the third question in our, uh, that I set out um, at the beginning of my talk, which is to look at how um, forming a cognitive map in one task domain actually influences processing in a new task domain. And this is work by, done by a, another postdoc currently in my lab, Kate Sherrill. And so Kate actually uses virtual reality paradigms to study um, memory formation and knowledge extraction and decision-making in my lab. And so here she actually had participants perform um, a very simple navigation task in four different um, uh, virtual environments. Here's a castle um, and a forest, um, this is a desert and an arena. And so they just learned the locations of four um, objects within the environment here. Um, there are again these three dimensional objects. So this is what a learning trial looks at. At the beginning of the trial, they receive a cue, like go find the purple one. And the trial that I'm showing you now is a, a trial very early in learning. And so they get this cue and then the person freely navigates throughout this kind of forest or meadow environment until they find or reach within like a radius of the object's location. So here they, they're just kind of, you know, looking, looking, looking. And eventually they go over to its location and then it pops out in front of them. And so they learn these, um, again, there's four objects they learn in each environment. So 16 objects across each of these four environments. And so again, they see the, you know, they get put in the environment, they see a cue, they navigate and actually they receive um, feedback in this particular task as well. And so <clears throat> this design is very similar, though, to the in concept to what we did in the initial inference study. So again, we use these pre and post exposure learning designs. So here we showed each of the objects in isolation prior to learning um, and after learning. And one thing I should emphasize is that they didn't learn about an environment all at once. So all the forest meadow trials went together. They actually interleaved between all of the different environments during learning. So there's have no temporal um, information that they can use to guide learning in this particular task either. And so again, what we wanted to look at is how the information about the representations for the object shifted as a function of learning about their spatial locations in each of these four environments. And in particular, we were very interested in how people differentiated or um, integrated re representations or of objects that were seen in the same or different environments. And so here I'm just kind of plotting these similarity changes in a different way. So again, we're just kind of use these pattern similarity analyses. And here I'm just taking two of the um, environments and um, giving you kind of, again, a schematic of what's represented. So here are three of the four objects seen in the desert environment, three of the four objects seen in the forest environment. And this is just, a, again, a, a schematic of a pre-learning um, similarity grid. And so you would expect prior to learning, they have some baseline level of similarity just based on the the physical properties of the objects themselves, and that we can look about how those representations change as a function of learning, whereas the desert items become more similar to one another as a function of learning and differentiated from the objects that actually are seen in the forest environments themselves. And so you can compare these pre and post learning similarities to look at kind of a learning related change um, across the objects represented in different and, and similar environments. And so here, again, we're looking about how the objects are formed, uh, transformed according to their spatial commonalities. 
And so not surprisingly, given um, the focus of my talk is that we, Kate finds that regions in hippocam anterior hippocampus and posterior medial prefrontal cortex show um, uh, formation of these hierarchical codes that represent not only um, increased similarity for objects seen in the uh, same environments, at the same time also differentiate objects seen in different environments. But the real, so again, just to kind of belabor the point, right here I'm showing you very similar regions across two different task domains in this kind of associative learning environment and then this navigation task. Very similar regions form these kind of integrated um, or form these hierarchical codes of experience that allow you to um, uh, represent um, unobserved relationships in the environment. But the real kind of novelty of Kate's study is this particular question is how do these maps form through the spatial learning influence predictions in a temporal task, right? And so she had her very same participants come in for a second day of scanning. So 24 hours after they participated in that virtual navigation task, they came back and they just saw the individual objects again in isolation. And here they just rated their preference for these objects on this, you know, one to four scale, and just how much do you like this object or not? But unbeknownst to the participant, the sequence in which these objects were shown were actually organized into these, tri into these triplets where they saw three objects that were um, uh, coded in the same environment and then subsequently saw three objects from three different environments and so on and so forth. And so what we were really interested in this is this particular transition um, between a same environment and a different environment triplet, right? And so here you might expect it to be a boundary um, as defined by kind of the spatial experience that you have. And so one behavioral phenomenon we observed in Kate's data is that people's um, performance on this uh, kind of incidental preference task was showed sensitivity to this particular boundary transition. So their um, response time was actually slower for the objects after this boundary um, uh, than it was before. So people are sensitive to these particular um, boundaries between these same and these different environment triplets. And what's also interesting is the degree of hippocampal um, map formation from day one predicted individual's boundary sensitivity. So higher coherence in the map, more slowing that you saw at these, for the response times at these boundaries. So there is something about the relationship and how hippocampus is coding um, these object representations of influencing how people process this kind of information and time in this preference task. But we were also really interested in what's happening, um, you know, within the same environment treatment and again, across this boundary from the same to the different environment triplet. We predicted that there might be contextual predictions built up from the spatial environment across these sequential presentations. So we also had <coughs> our participants um, scan during a viewpoint independent localizer with involving the four environments. So here I'm just showing you four still images taken from the desert environment. And so we interleaved still images from all four environments and then use those to train a classifier to decode viewpoint independent reactivation of kind of desert experience during this particular sequence task. And so what we actually were looking for is that, again, these are hypotheticals here. The idea is that you're looking for um, increasing activation of the desert environment across the same environment triplet, right? So you're making an environmental prediction across these same environment objects that, you know, and that would be specific for the, the environment that it was associated with. But that prediction actually would fall off at this particular boundary. So really where you see a decrease in this reactivation of context specific information across this boundary item. And again, when we looked for regions that showed this kind of contextual prediction during the sequence task, we again showed that hippocampus was um, you know, showing these increased um, predictions about the contextual information that then dropped off at the boundaries. And if you remember from kind of the overarching framework I laid out at the very beginning of the talk, we think that hippocampus is actually important in sending these contextual predictions to um, medial prefrontal cortex. And so we also looked at connectivity between this anterior hippocampal region and um, this MPFC region during uh, at the boundary. And we found that there's decreased connectivity between these regions after the boundary versus before it. 
And so we might think of that this reflects that there's um, a drop off in signaling predictions from the hippocampus to the VMPFC. At the same time, in this um, particular, at this item after the boundary, we actually also simultaneously saw increased signals in univariate, right, just the magnitude of response in um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex actually increased after the boundary, perhaps reflecting an increased like uncertainty signal after the boundary items. So in Kate's work, what we see is that the hippocampus and um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex learn both spatial commonalities and differences, and that these spatial maps can bias experience um, in these kind of, in the sequence task in particular, um, and that in these kind of sequential prediction tasks, you can see hippocampal predictions accumulate across time, and that these drops in prediction signals um, at event boundaries may simultaneously be accompanied by increased prefrontal uncertainty signals and together might be a very important mechanism by which we segment episodic experience. Okay, so here again, I've shown you examples of how we form these cognitive maps in kind of associative tasks and in spatial learning environments. I don't have time to talk to you about some of our recent work looking at about these in, um, uh, in true temporal or statistical learning tasks, but we do have paradigms um, designed from the community structure tasks that we're doing in concert with Ana Shapiro to look at formation of these um, same cognitive maps and community structures and how they bias reasoning. But you know, I only have so much time, so I'm not gonna tell you about that today, but indeed they, they show a lot of the same regions being involved. In this last kind of part of the talk, I'm gonna talk to you about our work in the concept learning domain, which is work done with um, Mike Mack, who was a former postdoc now at the University of Toronto and Brad Love, who's at UCL. And so this last part of the talk, I'm really kind of gonna hone in on medial prefrontal cortex um, in particular and its role in maybe helping um, bias kind of hippocampal representation, right? And particularly in an intention guided or goal directed manner. So in this kind of, in this set of experiments, we use a very simple kind of concept learning tasks. And so here we take these bugs um, and these bugs have several different features. Today, I'm gonna pay attention to three of them. The antenna, what we hear is the pincer, pincers or the mandible. And then here also the legs are gonna be the features we're gonna pay attention to today. And so I've just plotted those in a kind of a, a toy multi-dimensional space here. So in one of the um, kind of classification or, or concept learning tasks that they perform, people categorize these bugs according to a very simple one-dimensional rule where a single feature determines category membership. And here it's the legs or the single feature. So here the bugs with thin legs are in cate one category and the bugs with thick legs are in another category. So it's a unidimensional rule that depends on the single feature of legs. People also then categorize these very same bugs um, using an X or rule. And so that rule, two of the features matter here, the opposite to the antenna and the pincers. So the way the X or rule works is that the thick antenna with the scoopy mandible is in the same category as the bug with the thin antenna and the pincer mandible. Right? And so that's an XOR structure. And so there's actually a third task, which I'll kind of describe in more detail later. But for now, we're just going to focus on these two one-dimensional and two-dimensional rules. And they learn these after an initial familiarization task. The familiarization task actually requires pay attention to all three features. But <clears throat> I'll focus on that a little bit. So they just have to answer, you know, is this a warm or a cool bug? So that's like the two categories. And they learn these via feedback. And for some participants, they learn to categorize according to the one dimensional rule first, followed by the two dimensional XOR rule, and some learn it in the opposite direction. And so the question is, is how do people actually learn to or represent these bugs as a function of learning these particular rule spaces? And so here, this is just people's performance on this task. And you can see that while the two dimensional task is certainly, a little, people are a little bit slower to learn it, they still learn it very well by the end of the um, training phase. And here we actually use a model developed by um, Brad called Sustain that allows us to fit um, the behavior in this task. And so this is a clustering model that Brad's developed. And so there's an initial, initial attention layer that you know, filters the features of um, different attention weights. There's, um, and so we can look at this attention weight layer to see how people are allocating their attention to the specific features of the task. 
So here, when learning the one-dimensional rule, people tend to allocate to the most important feature. This is lambda one, which in this case is the legs, right? So there's more, the attention weights on that one are higher than for the other two. But when learning the two-dimensional rule or the XOR rule, the attention weights for lambda two and lambda three here, the antenna and the mandible are actually higher than they are for the legs, right? So people are allocating their attention to the correct features as a function of learning in this task. There's also this cluster that, you know, kind of the meat of this model is in the clustering layer. Um, and so that's kind of what we consider the knowledge layer in this model. And so when fitting people's behavior, um, you can, after you fit a person's behavior to the task, you can present the model with the bugs and you can say, how does any given bug activate the cluster layer, right? So how many clusters and which clusters that actually cause activation in the model? And you can just create a vector of cluster level activation for each of the bugs and compare them to one another in a representational space. And that's what's plotted here. So here, if we look at the representations for the bugs in the two-dimensional rule, you can see that the bugs one through four are in the same category and five through eight are in a different category. And so they very much separate, they activate different um, parts of the knowledge layer. The structure, of course, for the XOR rules looks a little bit more complicated just because of the structure of the task. Here, um, bugs one, four, five, and eight are in the same category and two, three, six, and seven are. And so that just reflects the activation of the knowledge layer, layer there. Um, and so here, what we show is that if we look at the kind of the attention weighting driving for the model, compare that to neural similarity in this task, what we show is that interior hippocampus forms these attention weighted concepts and that these are just the actual neural projections from this particular region. And they form these kind of optimal structures present, that represent this information. So separating based on the legs or separating based on the uh, antenna and the mandible in this case. And what we also show is that this anterior hippocampus early during learning when it's forming these representations and these tasks is also communicating with um, uh, prefrontal and parietal regions in this task. And we were very in interested in what potentially medial prefrontal cortex is doing in service of learning in this task. And so we really hypothesize that PFC may play an important role in the reducing the dimensionality um, representations in a goal-directed manner. And so here, to look at adjust that particular hypothesis, we not only looked at this simple task, this one-dimensional rule task, and the XOR rule, the two-dimensional rule, but we also use the familiarity task, which actually required attention to three dimensions. And so what one can might imagine is that for this one dimensional rule, it's a very um, low complexity task. And so you can compress a lot of information and still um, efficiently um, categorize in this particular task. The more dimensions that are relevant, right, the higher complexity the categorization task, less you can compress the representations, right? You need to maintain higher dimensionality representations to be able to distinguish the features in this case. And so what you might predict is as a function of learning across the blocks, you might see increased evidence for compression in the, in the least complex tasks. So in the low dimensional task, the low complexity task, you get the highest compression versus in the high, the high complexity task, you get the lowest um, compression. And to do this, we just on a trial by trial basis submitted um, voxel patterns to principal components analysis. We did this multiple ways. The way I'm depicting here is we took for each one, we took the top three principal components and looked at how much variance in trial to trial activity or, or uh, it explained, and that was our compression score. And so that's what we're kind of looking for here is that regions that show this particular pattern increase compression for the least complex tasks as a function of learning. And so that's indeed what we saw in this medial prefrontal cortex region. You see increased compression in the low complexity tasks less so for the median complexity class cross learning and not much at all for the high complexity tasks. And we also related that to people's attention. So we specifically actually uh, quantified people's uh, attention using entropy. So here entropy has high when you pay attention equally to all three features. Entropy is low when you pay attention to one particular feature. And so we actually got everybody's uh, entropy weights or attention weights from the model and related that to this kind of compression score from the VMPFC. And we found that the enhanced VMC, VMPFC compression was associated with um, entropy rate. So um, the, lower your, uh, attention, the lower your entropy score, so the, the higher attention is to a single feature, 
was associated with higher compression in BMPFC. So we see this direct relationship between the amount of compression and people's attentional allocation in this task. And so kind of some general conclusions across the body of this work. I hope I've convinced you that these two structures are very important for forming cognitive maps across many domains of experience. Um, and that they actually do so by representing these um, abstract geometries that allow uh, one to extract knowledge beyond direct experience. And that this learning occurs in part through dimensionality reduction via selective intention um, that's goal directed. And that these representations not only support the ability to remember specific events, but allow us to flexibly infer and generalize our knowledge across experiences. And so I'll stop there and thank all of you for your attention. <laughs> thanks. Oh. Um, thanks very much. That was an absolutely brilliant talk. Um, a lot, uh, a lot of amazing work. Um, yeah. So, so thanks. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm not actually going to use my uh, position and ask the first question, even though sure. there's already several questions uh, lined up. So I was interested. Um, so it seems like all of your um, all of your PFC integration or generalization effects are quite posterior, uh, medial wall, um, where, yeah. and ex except one, right? Except the, the third order um, algebra yeah. effect it seems to be super anterior and actually is where in the first study you show the difference, yeah. it's almost like frontal pole. Yeah. So I was wondering what, why do you think that is? Or what's, what's the difference between these effects? So I think it's, it's a brilliant question that I don't really have the answer to now, but something we're kind of trying to dig into is like when, you know, what this kind of grading of representation in MPFC actually means and what these different parts of MPFC are doing that might be distinct from one another. I think these early to be very honest, in that first, the very first study I described to you, Meg's study, we actually didn't anticipate seeing that gradient. That's kind of came out in a data-driven manner. And, um, and so we thought it was interesting and potentially compelling because it does suggest that this MPFC is not one uniform hulk of a thing, right? And I think that's something that many of us appreciate, but sometimes don't necessarily write about that way in our papers, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the the work from the the Neil's work about the higher order stuff, you know, it's much more orbital frontal, right? And it's, you know, more kind of anterior. And that definitely goes along with a lot of the work, um, you know, from like Yale, Niv's lab, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Jeff Schoenbaum's work, which are highly similar regions kind of showing these orbital frontal regions that are coding these complex task spaces. So and that was less surprising in that task that we got those in, when we were looking for those kind of higher order relationships that we saw them there. Now, you know, how that relates to kind of the differentiation findings in the, uh, you know, initial study, I'm not quite sure yet, right? I think what we really want to try to get a sense is, is how abstracted the representations are in these various regions, right? Like how much you lose mnemonic detail, because even within hippocampus, we see some regions that, you know, kind of extract general properties and you actually lose the ability to differentiate individual instances that happens. Other regions maintain like the full hierarchy. You can both differentiate individual rep, um, representations while also right, extracting principles. And so there may be some similar kind of level of knowledge organization, like some abstraction gradient across the MPFC that we don't have the right data for yet. So, and as we know, the PSC is so task dependent, right? It's so flexible, right? You know, it, it really kind of, can reorganize itself based on the task demands of layer flexible manual. So I don't think we have the right paradigm yet to really kind of go after that, to assess like the, you know, what exactly computationally is going on in these different MPFC regions. But I think it's a super fascinating question. And then, you know, to some degree, um, non-human primate work or rodent work might be you know, better suited to look at these yeah. things too. I think it, it leaves a lot of open questions to look across like species at these kind of questions as well. Great. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so uh, Kenneth, uh, do you want to unmute? Hi, yeah, uh, this is a really incredible talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify how exactly you quantified similarity between neural representations? Yeah, so that we just actually used, right, um, correlations, right, Pearson's correlations. So you just take an 
a pattern of activation on, for any given object and compare it to all other objects in a given set, whether it has shares a relationship to it or not, and how we split those trials depends on the task. Um, and then to test significance, we compare it to like a bootstrapped um, uh, you know, distribution. So we shuffle the trials, we relabel them in a random way to generate kind of the, the baseline similarity structure. And that's how we compare significance. Like when we show like a, a change in similarity, it's based on a bootstrap distribution. So it's very simple actually math, um, just correlational math. Got it, thank you.